right? We're talking about pushing the limits or flirting with sin. And there are several people in the Bible that might come to mind when you think about the idea of kind of flirting with sin. The most obvious one might be Samson, right? Uh, Tonight, though, I want to look at maybe one that wouldn't come like right to your mind first thing. Uh, when you think about flirting with sin, the, not the most obvious choice. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13 looking at Lot, uh, Abra, Abram at the time, but Abraham's nephew. And I want to clarify kind of our terms here, what we mean when we talk about flirting with sin. When we say that, we really mean how close to hell can I get? without actually going there. That's, that's kind of what flirting with sin really means, is how close to hell can I get without actually going there. So I want to give you some historical background on Lot and Abraham. I'm just going to call him Abraham, but just at this time in Scripture, God had not changed his name yet, but it was Abram. But Lot was Abraham's nephew, and they were living in the land of Canaan. They were tent dwellers. Um, And I have a picture coming up later uh, to give you a good idea of that. But you probably know what that looks like. Um, Like permanent tent dwelling people. So they weren't like like pitching like a camping tent. It was like really like heavy duty material, able to withstand winds and things like that. Uh, But they were living in the land of Canaan along with the rest of their families. And then this great famine came into the land. And so they ended up going south into Egypt to ride out the famine. And while they were there, they actually ended up doing pretty well for themselves. They like, became pretty wealthy and gathered for themselves more material goods and cattle than they've ever had in their entire life. And then Canaan becomes fertile again. The land becomes good again. And so they head back. And along the way, as they're, as they're approaching the land, because they've had more than they've ever had before, Abram and Lot's servants kind of start bickering with each other about, well, like, you know, Lot's cows should eat here, and Abram's cows should eat over there. And there was bickering back and forth about who should take their cattle where. And so Abraham does this really unprecedented thing, because he's the oldest. He should have first choice. Biblically speaking, he should have first choice. But he says, you know what, Lot? We're back here in the land of Canaan. I'm just going to give you first choice. Where do you want to go? You can, you can pick anywhere you want to go, and I'll go the other way. And that way, we're not going to divide, divide the family like between infighting and fighting with each other. We're just going to go our separate ways and live at peace, and you can take your side, I'll take mine, and be good. And so that's where we are when we jump into Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. And there's a, really a lot to unpack here in like, just a few verses. Like, have you, anybody ever heard of a flyover state? Anybody ever, ever heard of that term? You know what that term means? It's like uh, kind of like the middle, middle America, like Nebraska and all those places. It's like, oh, they just grow corn there. Let's fly over them because nobody wants to drive through them. Okay? I think sometimes we tend to do that with Scripture. We have readover verses where it's just like, logically, I understand what this verse says but it has a really, really deep meaning for us spiritually if we dive into it. So I kind of think that these verses can tend to be that way, these particular verses. So let's read Genesis uh, 13, 10 through 13. <clears throat> and Lot lifted up his eyes, so he's looking at the land of Canaan, and beheld the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. So this land is looking good. It looks like the garden of Eden to Lot, is what it's saying. Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and there separated themselves one from another, Abram and Lot separating themselves. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked sinners 
before the Lord, or were, sin, uh, were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's the English major in me coming out there. <clears throat> so what's so interesting here in Genesis chapter 13, and just these three verses, is how Lot, out of all the places he could have gone, he pitched his tent in one direction toward a city, right? You would think that naturally he would kind of want to get away from the city with all his livestock and everything. But he pinches, pitches his tent right towards Sodom. And Sodom, as verse 13 tells us, was a place known for wickedness. And Lot definitely would have known this. And I just can't help but think as I read over this, like how often we flirt with sin. The things that we know are exceedingly wicked in the sight of the Lord. How, how we often try to get close enough to them without crossing that line. So let's see how, how Lot chose his land. Lot made his choice purely based on what he could see with his own eyes. So he is only thinking about the material possessions and material abundance of the land. He cares nothing for how it's going to impact his family. What he sees is good to him. But he doesn't have enough forethought to connect the dots that here am I looking at probably one of the most sinful places on earth, right? It'd be like, be like pitching your tent outside Vegas right now or something like that. He didn't have enough foresight to think about, could this place have a draw on my family? Could the enemy use this against me to pull on my children, my wife? He was only thinking about the richness of the land before him. As much as anything, faith means that we do not walk by what we see, but we know to be true in God. That's what we walk by when we walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Abram was walking by faith, but Lot was only walking only by sight. Then notice the setup. Pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. It's only that far for now in Scripture. It's only that far just for now. Because as we get into the rest of the story, Lot later becomes involved with the goings-on and the daily happenings of Sodom. He moves into the city itself. And you know what? I'm sure Lot thought, because Lot was a righteous man, I'm sure he thought that I can serve God here. They probably need a witness but he was deceiving himself. And we need to be aware of our ability to deceive ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. And we do that, don't we? I mean, we deceive ourselves. We play with sin, thinking we're safe, thinking we're being careful, and we'll never cross that line and we're good at it, too. When I think of, like, my teenage years and my friends and, and kind of how I could connect this back to, like, being a teenager, I think of, like, using dating as a, as a witnessing tool, as a ministry tool. When you're dating someone that you know isn't saved what temptations might lie and wait for you that you may not realize because you're solely thinking about one thing and not other things. I also think about friends, right? If we're being honest, like being a teenager is really difficult, especially like during this day and age. Like I honestly, seriously, guys, like I would not envy being a teenager right now. I, I know it's got to be difficult. And you have this desire where you want to be accepted by people, maybe even in society. But you also want to stand for God. And so maybe at some point you start getting attention from the people who don't 
love the Lord. And maybe the people who do love the Lord aren't giving you as much attention as you'd like. And so you just, hey, they need a witness. I'll just pitch my tent over here. And I'll just be friends with them because they give me the attention that I want. We do that. But what is the nature of sin? Let's look at the one who authored it, Satan himself. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So Satan is like a lion. Do you ever think you can just play with a lion without getting mauled or eaten? But even the domesticated lions, right? They're not in the petting zoos. They're behind triple pane glass and can't even get your pinky in there, right? There's a reason the lions aren't in the petting zoos. Notice the end result. And this is eventually what happens. You might be very familiar with this story. You might not be. But this is the result of flirting with sin. Genesis 19 goes on to tell the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family had moved into the city. His daughters were engaged to local men in the city. And Lot was at the edge of the gate, which is like the area where like financial business and like law and jurisdiction business took place. And then two angels came into the town, and Lot invited them to stay with his family. And after a rather exciting evening, probably one of the craziest nights you might ever read about in Scripture, the angels made sure Lot and his wife and his two daughters left before God destroyed the city. Because in that night, the very nature of the city itself comes out to play. And we see just how exceedingly wicked Sodom and Gomorrah are. So the angels tell them to leave. And as they fled, the angels warn them. You skip ahead to the next slide for me. The angels warn them, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. And Lot ran. He ran with his daughters close behind, but his wife from behind him, looked back. She became a pillar of salt. She lagged behind. She turned and watched flaming sulfur fall from the sky, consuming everything that she valued. Then it consumed her. The Hebrew word for looked back means more than just to glance over your shoulder. It's kind of like a, oh, okay, passing glance. It means to register something, to study it, to to bring it to mind and hold your gaze there. And the scriptures don't tell us whether her death was a punishment for maybe looking back on Sodom and Gomorrah. She's that little, little dot back there in case you haven't realized it, but... The scripture doesn't tell us if it's just a punishment for looking back at everything she kind of held dear or if it's just simply because the angels of the Lord told them not to look back and she disobeyed God. Either she identified too much with the city and joined it or she neglected to fully obey God's warning and she died. But all of this happened because Lot first put his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah. So I just want to, it's not, it's not super deep. It's not super complex. It's pretty straightforward. But the application for us, it's pretty much the application for everything we do. Where's your heart tonight? Do you desire sin? Or do you run from it? 
do you foolishly run toward it and think you're strong enough not to cross that line? If you think that, that's a foolish way of thinking for two reasons. One, you are not strong enough. And when you turn away from God and toward temptation and sin, you're flying solo because in your heart you've already taken the first step away from God. And if you think you can play with temptation and not cross the line into sin and still be close with God, you're kidding yourself because, again, you've already taken the first step away from him. Sinful choices don't lead the heart astray. A stray heart makes sinful choices. Let's go to the next slide. It's a familiar landmark. It's in Italy. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. Which way will it fall when it falls? It's going to fall the way it's leaning, right? You'd pretty much have to defy every law of physics that exists for that thing to fall back the other way. It's going to fall this way. And why is it going to fall that way? Because it's already leaning that way. It's the same way with our hearts. We go whichever way we're already headed. We go where our hearts are. And the second thing is that there's nothing biblical about the approach of flirting with sin. I mean, duh, right? God tells us the direction in which we are to go. James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. 1 Peter 1, 16. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We're going to close up with this right here. But why is this important? Like, why is this so important? And I don't want this to take away the the fact that I'm going to read a little bit here because I I wrote this from the heart and I wrote it for you guys. And I just am not talented enough to have it all memorized. But I I wanted to communicate everything I wanted to say clearly. And I can do that better written. But I wrote this for you guys. So don't let the fact that I'm reading it take away. But can I just be really transparent and tell you guys that I've been there? I've been in this place of curiosity, winning me over to the idea of how close I can get to the edge of the pool of sin without falling in. I just want to dip my toe in it right now and not get my whole body wet. The thing is, you can't. And in this place, Satan wants you to grow bitter toward God. He wants, you, he wants to tell you that God is a killjoy, He doesn't want you to experience life and the things of the world. That Christianity is just a a bunch of rules to keep you from satisfying your curiosity and experiencing life. And I know this because I've been there. Adam and Eve were there too. I know the pool that curiosity has on the soul. And when I stuck my toe out, the only thing that was left to do was fall in. Because your balance is already off at that point. God's word has principles and guidelines for us to live by because it's the only way to ensure our true joy and freedom in Christ. His precepts for how we should live are not burdensome. Scripture tells us that. Take it from someone who's been to the edge of sin and fell in. And you don't have to take it from me. You can take it probably from some of your own experiences. You can take it from my wife. You can take it from Andy. You can take it from Kathy. When you fall in, there's nothing for you there. There is nothing for you there. And my my heart for you guys and my fear for you guys is that you're getting to the ages where this pool is going to become stronger and stronger and stronger for you. But I want you to understand that God's ways for us are not restrictive. They actually, actually lead to this like wide open plane of fulfillment and joy that cannot be found in sin. And like this is so basic, it's so elementary. We know this, right? But this is what we talked about in growth group tonight. And that's what I'm praying we connect with tonight is like sometimes you hear the same simple truth you've heard your entire life, but, but one night prayerfully and thank the Lord, it hits you in a different way. And you're like, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. I didn't understand this. It's been in front of my face the whole time. 
Is your heart tonight set on overcoming temptation and sin and growing in Christ? If so, hey, praise the Lord. That's awesome. Maybe your heart desires to be more like Christ, but you're really struggling with the flesh and sin, and things seem estranged between you and God right now. Will you confess that to him? Will you repent and turn from it? God will forgive you. And better than that, he gives you the strength to overcome whatever struggle it is you have. Or has your heart been loving your sin and really just despising the Lord? Is your tent pitched towards Sodom, set on sin? That's a scary place to be spiritually. Do you desire to flirt with temptation and extract as much pleasure out of it as you can without crossing the line so you can feel good about being a good Christian? If so, I'd lovingly like to tell you, I cannot talk tonight. If so, I'd lovingly like to tell you that your heart's not right before God. And it could be that you don't even know Christ and you think you do. So if you're moved tonight and if you recognize the Holy Spirit working in you, convicting you, whatever that may be, whatever that may look like, if there's something you need to talk about, I desperately want to talk about that with you. My wife desperately wants to talk about that with you. Andy and Kathy desperately want to talk about that with you. And you shouldn't be embarrassed. Like if you're struggling... If you have a question, and this just isn't for tonight. This is for the whole of our time together. Not one of us are going to judge you. Not one of us are going to look down on you. It's not going to change the way we think about you because we've all been there. We all struggle with sin, and we struggle with it to different degrees. But this is exactly what church is for. We're here to do spiritual things and come before the Lord as we are. But if you're leaving here week after week and you don't recognize a desire for more of Christ, then something is not right. And I'm concerned for you. And I want to help you get that right. Let's pray.